Great, we've got some more folks rolling in. Um, I'm probably gonna get us started with presentations about 9.05. So um, feel free to take a look at the agenda. And um, if you are just arriving, we're putting our name, affiliation, and your favorite signal that spring is here in the chat box. I do have to admit, you know, looking at Remke's post here, I spent a lot of time wandering around my yard just watching the buds on all of my different shrubs and trees and bushes this time of year. Yeah, just see your comment that Robins are already here. Robin is here. <laughs> hey, Robin! That is my favorite sign of spring. Robin <laughs> on Zoom. Glad to be here. <laughs> Mark Lovell, hearing the birds pecking on the outside wall, the flickers, and that's another sign. I heard the other day a flicker just cacking off in the distance. I was like, oh yeah, here they come. Why, why am I upside down? <laughs> you look good that way. No, oh, there we go, there we go. <laughs> My favorite sign of spring is that Bob is upside down on his camera. <laughs> well, I'm still trying to figure out Zoom. I'm getting there closer. You're doing your bat imitation, Bob. <laughs> there we go. I see my virtual. <clears throat> Great, so um, I'm gonna give people just one more minute to get settled in. If you've just joined us, um, put your name, your affiliation, and the, um, your favorite sign of spring, that spring is coming or that spring is here in the chat box. Okay, great. Awesome, we've got a great group of folks. Mike Grumke has prepared um, some good information for us. And uh, Matt Tootin's gonna take us on a little virtual tour today, which is gonna be fun. <laughs> got some awesome people to help me out with breakout rooms. It's great. Okay, um, so just a quick overview. Um, I put it in the chat as well, but I'm Dana Hayward. I work for the Mountain Studies Institute and I coordinate the San Juan Headwaters Forest Health Partnership. Um, thank you so much everyone for making time this morning. Um, last year in February, we did uh, our science forum at the Extension Office um, here in town in February, just before our world changed. And um, now we are gonna split it up into two pieces this month and next month. Um, I will remind you again that the next month's date is April 14th in the afternoon. So make sure you have it on your calendar. And I look forward to some great discussions this morning. We're gonna start off with Mike Remke. He's gonna share some data and information from our geography uh, collected in the field season last year. We'll have Mike's presentation and then some time for questions. And then we will have Matt Tootin is going to go over um, some implementation status and some upcoming implementation projects. And we'll have time for questions for Matt. <clears throat> then we're going to go through some small group discussions. I've got some awesome folks that are going to help me facilitate your conversations. They'll be about 35 minutes long. And then we'll wrap up. I'm going to use the information that you all provide to your small group facilitators to structure the beginning of our conversation next month on the on the 14th. So I promise it's not for naught. Um, I care about your feedback and we want to know as we move forward how we can apply science in our landscape and to our partnership. So thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand the mic over to Mike. <laughs> and uh, does anybody have any any questions or procedure um, procedure things that they want to bring forward before Mike gets chatting? Great. 
Okay, awesome. Um, well, Mike, it's all you. Thanks for the mic, Dana. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all this morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Michael Remke. I'm a research associate with Mountain Studies Institute and also a professor of biology at the Fort Lewis College. And this morning, I'm going to share with us a little narrative um, and a little more of a technical science talk in managing mesic mixed conifer or wet mixed conifer forests. And my subtitle here is Learning from Monitoring in the Rainforest of the San Juan. Um, I, I think this is an appropriate and fun subtitle because uh, when I first started working on this, Matt and started meeting and interacting with Matt too, and he joked and was like, are you all having fun up in the rainforest? And uh, this must have been like my second week or third week of work with Mountain Studies Institute. And it was uh, June and we went to one of these sites, Pagosa Creek with Marion Chambers to start working on some of our monitoring protocols and got totally rained out and spent the entire day, it was Emily Swindell, Anthony Culpepper, Marion and myself. And we just spent the entire day, rain hoods up in the forests here, just like admiring how these parts of the San Juans catch so much precipitation. So it's fun to, uh, turn some of that information around and share it back with you all. Uh, before I dive too deep into this, I just want to start with uh, a nice suite of acknowledgements. And, you know, first of all, none of what I'm talking about would be possible without the San Juan Headwaters Forest Health Partnership. What you all do as a stakeholder group is bring efforts like this to the, to the table, to the dialogue, and also turn it into implementation and not just implementation of, of doing good work in the forest, but also collecting data and uh, getting presentations like this together. So the collaborative is absolutely crucial in everything I'm about to share. Um, and then, you know, Aaron Kimple, Anthony, Dana, Emily, and then a whole numerous list of people who have contributed to data collection and time spent in the field, including um, Emily and Landon Sawaya, who's one of our field techs, Estefan Vega, Tim Leishman, and then I, I just can't thank Julie Korb enough for all of her thoughts and insights into forest ecology and mentorship in my career. So a uh, huge list of acknowledgements that have made all of this work possible. To start thinking about mixed conifer, I, I want to first take a step back and remind all of us of the geography that we've decided to work in that we call the San Juan Headwaters Forest Health Partnership. And you know, when I first came to these meetings, gosh, 10 years ago now, uh, these meetings were called the Mixed Conifer Working Group. And uh, I was living at the time up in the East Fork of the Piedra River uh, on the Notch Ranch representing the, the Lindner family as a stakeholder in some of these dialogues and conversations. And really, when we look at the Pagosa Springs and San Juan Headwaters geography, uh, what I've put on this map are just the forest types that we would kind of classically delineate and think about when we talk about mixed conifer. So the uh, brighter browns here, here. Um, are, are really dry mixed conifer that it's like the ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, oak components. And then as we uh, move up in elevation, we're in, into these deeper, darker greens. We're moving into the wet mixed conifer and aspen and aspen mixed conifer mixed forests. And, you know, with the exception of the immediate circle that's more ponderosa pine driven right around Pagosa Springs, we really just see a whole heck of a lot of mixed conifer forests in this geography. And of course, the even higher elevations are more of that spruce fir dominance. And ultimately, this is a great thing for this collaborative to come together on because there's less conversation about mixed conifer forests than say ponderosa pine. So this is like a really fun and exciting way for you all to have something to engage in and be part of the conversation on. So really, San Juan Headwaters is rooted in mixed conifer management. And this 
driving question of this group from day one was how can we manage these complex ecosystems? We early on recognized it wasn't as simple as what was happening in the adjacent Ponderosa pine forest where a lot of research has been done. And so Kristen Pels put together and presented a workshop on mixed conifer forests for this group 10, 11 years ago now. Um, and, and this mixed conifer knowledge synthesis became kind of this like foundation of knowledge and understanding. And I want to point out that um, you all have chartered uh, CFRI and, and now myself is working in partnership with Marin Chambers to generate a mixed conifer knowledge synthesis for 2021. And so we are continuing to update our knowledge about these systems. And for right now, I just want to share with these ellipsoids of like, there is a lot of uncertainty about these systems. We still just don't know a whole lot about what's going on in terms of the ecology and certainly in the management. But what we do know, um, and what I really want to focus in on is more of these mesic or wet mixed conifer systems uh, is quite a bit. And, and so I want to share some of that present knowledge to help us understand these systems. And uh, there's a lot of different dominant species that we'll see in these systems, including Douglas fir, we'll see white fir, we'll see blue spruce and aspen. And then Ponderosa pine is still a present player in these wetter forest types. It's just less common than it is in other geographies. And something that's really important to understand when we think about these wet mixed conifer forests is that stand conditions vary across and within stands based on very um, simple yet complicated factors. So like topographic position. And what I mean by this is whether you're in like the valley bottom or up on a ridge top. And specifically, what we tend to see is when we're in the valley bottoms, we have more blue spruce. It likes to have its feet wet. It likes the shade down there. Versus when you get up onto the upper slopes and ridge tops that are uh, better drained soils and a little more exposed to uh, solar radiation, we tend to see more of that ponderosa pine component. And then similarly, aspect. Right, south facing slopes that are drier are more likely to have these dry species like ponderosa, whereas north facing slopes, uh, more shaded, we're going to see more of that fir, spruce type of component. So these vary a lot within small features like valley bottom versus ridge top. But then they also vary across larger climatic and soil gradients. So if we think about the San Juan Mountains, and we're talking about the Pagosa Springs geography, which catch a lot of that Southwest flow, bring a ton of snow and rain to the, to the region. We have these really productive, really wet sites versus if we end up say over in La Jarita or, or the Northeastern San Juans that are more cold in the rain shadow and get less precipitation, then we see less productive, slower growing, drier sites. So lots of factors into where we might expect to see uh, different types of stands on this landscape. And what this might look like, uh, both of these photos are from uh, the Pagosa Creek geography. So when we look at a wet site, we might see a whole lot of white fir and blue spruce. And um, the same geography in the same project area, we might see a lot more ponderosa pine, white fir and Douglas fir. And one other thing that I want to point out is these two photos look quite different from one another, not just in terms of species composition and understory, but despite their differences, they also can be right next to each other and intermixed. And you know, these sites also will have different processes that contribute to them. So drier sites, we might see some sort of infrequent mixed severity fire. And what I mean by mixed severity fire is a fire that in some cases is burning at the surface as a low intensity fire. And in other cases is burning uh, up into the canopy, torching individual trees or groups of trees as a moderate to high severity fire. And in Northern Arizona, some folks in these wet mixed conifer systems have documented that high severity patches could be five to 10 hectares or up to 74 hectares in size. And so when we, when we think about those numbers, 
uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about many acres of small patches that are burning in high severity, up to hundreds of acres, but never more than hundreds of acres in a natural fire regime, or rarely more than that. Um, and then in wetter sites, we're likely to see just infrequent high severity fire that's mostly driven by drought. And what I really want us to understand is these two sites can still be right next to each other where you have a wet site that is going to experience infrequent high severity fire. And that might be the valley bottom adjacent to a ridge that's actually going to experience this more infrequent mixed severity fire that maybe occurs more commonly than fire in the valley bottom. So we have complex variation over space. And just for fun, looking at this photo, you know, there's this pretty big Douglas fir and uh, pretty, uh, two pretty big Douglas firs in this photo that are kind of this like drier site type of condition. And there's some openings that likely represent one of these historic mixed severity fires. But as you like gaze into the woods in the background, we see really tightly interlocked canopies and wetter tree species, like there's some firs present and there's even some spruces visible and quite a bit of aspen. And so what we're really seeing is a site that may be burned more recently and immediately adjacent to a geography that hasn't burned in as much time. Uh, I don't have empirical data to support that, but that's just speculative on uh, what these stand conditions are and what these processes imply for what we see on the landscape. Another really important disturbance thing to, to understand or component of disturbance to understand in these systems is thinking about uh, insects. And in particular, I think it's important for us to think about and understand Western spruce budworm. This is a defoliant. So it's an insect that actually eats the, the needles of the trees and consumes buds of these trees. And some folks from uh, Tom Swetnam's lab group have spent actually a lot of time, including Ryerson, studying Western spruce budworm in the San Juan Mountains and have found that it occurs um, periodically in specific decades that are warm and wet. And so this is like every 30 to 60 years or so, there's these big outbreaks and pulses of spruce budworm and it tends to correspond to these more warm, wet years. And importantly, it really loves the shaded understory. Uh, it can attack mature trees and all the way to the top of trees, but it, it particularly loves the dense shading that we sometimes see in these fir forests. And so this is from Pagosa Creek geography. And uh, what we're looking at is a bunch of white fir that's pretty heavily defoliated by Western spruce budworm. And as the branches lose their needles, it's giving space for this uh, lichen called usnea or old man's beard uh, that many of you are familiar with to actually grow in the place of the needles on the branches. So this is an epithetic lichen that's just growing on the surface of the branches. And uh, for those who are interested, it actually is a great um, blood clot. So if you cut yourself in the woods, you can grab some usnea and put it on your wound and it'll help uh, slow the bleeding of your wound, but also it's a pretty strong indicator of these defoliated trees from spruce budworm. Okay, so what happens following these disturbances? Um, probably the best thing to say is that it's really complicated. There's lots of different trajectories a forest might take following disturbance, but soil moisture and pre-disturbance stand structure are seemingly really good predictors for post-disturbance regeneration. So what, what does that all mean? Well, in drier sites with lower soil moisture, you might expect to see tree species like Douglas fir or maybe even ponderosa pine regenerate. But if we have higher soil moisture in a stand structure that has a seedbed of more of the spruce fir type of dominance, then we might see regeneration trajectories take us more into that spruce fir component. So, thinking about A, do we have the seed to grow the tree? And then B, what is the environmental condition? And is it favorable for one of these species? And of course, aspen, which is a sprouting tree, 
if its present can establish itself extremely well post disturbance. And I think this is important to point out because aspen is a significant component of these forests. And in some cases, we might not even see above ground aspen stems, but there might be residual uh, root beneath ground and aspen can still sucker and establish following disturbance. Thus, aspen is important to think about as a potential disturbance response. Now, another thing to think about is compounded disturbance, right? What if we have some sort of fire and then immediately another fire or and some sort of insect and pest outbreak and then another uh, disturbance like a fire following that? Multiple disturbances in short time periods might create a situation where we see aspen come to dominate a stand that was previously mixed conifer simply because of its ability to sprout and that uh, rapid succession of disturbances might help convert conifer forest to more aspen dominated forest. Another thing that's really important to think about here in the San Juans and other geographies as well is uh, shrubs and understory shrub components. I think all of us have spent a lot of time talking about gamble oak and in these mixed conifer forests, the drier sites still have a strong gamble oak um, component. And some folks definitely have uh, concerns about gamble oak dominance or conversion following disturbance or overstory removal. So Guterman in um, the Los Conscious Fire has shown persistence of oak shrub fields following high severity fire. And Julie Korb has also shown uh, 10 years post restoration treatment in dry mixed conifer that we just ended up with a whole heck of a lot of gamble oak. So there's definitely some interest in the shrub layer. And what's important to think about as well is that these wetter sites um, tend to have all kinds of other shrubs, uh, snowberry, serviceberry, choke cherry, Rocky Mountain maple, and other shrubs. And many of these species tend to uh, be a little more shade loving than gamble oak, and they're also still sprouting shrubs. And I think it's also important to point out that choke cherry is a really important spring uh, food source for bears. Bears absolutely love eating the yummy, fatty choke cherries. So these shrubs are here, they're, they're ecologically important for wildlife, and they have these complex responses to disturbances since they're sprouting shrubs, but like varying degrees of light and other conditions. Okay, so succession. I, I think, you know, if we're going to talk about managing these forests, we're talking about some sort of disturbance, and thus we're talking about some sort of successional trajectory for these forests. And what's important to understand about mixed conifer forests is uh, really all of the differences we see on the ground could be thought of as a forest in a different stage of succession in one complex mosaic. So again, this photo shows how these different stages of succession could all be occurring adjacent to one another, where in the left foreground, we have uh, a few aspen sprouts. They're kind of hard to see, but there's some young aspen and that's adjacent to this spot that has some more mature aspen. And then behind the more mature aspen, you have an opening with less regeneration in it. But then right of center and in the background, you have mature overstory conifers, right? And so that's a different successional, more late successional stage. And all of these exist in a very small uh, land area relative to one another. So I think thinking of these forests as a mosaic of different successional trajectories is really helpful. And just for fun, to pull us out of the headwaters land for a second and look up into the Hermosa Creek drainage, uh, this is a photo I just really like to share when we talk about the mosaic because this is immediately after disturbance. This is one year post 416 fire. And when we look in the foreground, we see uh, a lot of dead gamble oak stems and some dead ponderosa pine trees. But when we look into the background, we see this hillside that's a mix of different forest stages. There's mature aspen, there's burnt aspen, there's mature conifer forest that's unburned or burned at low severity. There's mature conifer forest burnt at a mixed severity. There's mature conifer forest burnt at high severity. And they're all existing on one uh, hillside in this case in some sort of complex mosaic. 
right? So we can see this mosaic on the landscape and the legacy of this mosaic in a lot of different ways. And this can occur on the scale of uh, just a couple acres on one hillside like this to hundreds or thousands of acres, depending on the type of disturbance we have. Okay, so why would we manage mixed conifer forests? Many of these talks about forest management uh, often have some sort of theme about restoration. And you'll notice I haven't really touched on deviations from historical norms too much yet. Uh, and really, I think when we talk about mixed conifer forests, especially these wetter forests, one key idea about why we would manage these forests is to remove wood products and actually support economic values and markets. And then also, I think these mosaics of disturbances that I spent talking about in my introduction are patterns and processes that we can actually mimic and use uh, logging or, or uh, management as a tool to mimic these processes and promote healthy forest regeneration and create these uh, very heterogeneity uh, type patterns and mosaics on the landscape and thus support uh, wildlife use in these forests and help create and maintain resilience. Uh, so this is different than talking about classic restoration on the ground in these landscapes. Rather, I think I want to introduce this as ecological forestry and specifically ecological forestry has a few of these basic goals or principles that um, the projects I'm going to spend some time talking about directly incorporate. And so the first is incorporating biological legacies into harvest prescriptions. And that just means where you have some of these aspens and different successional trajectories, you actually incorporate that into how you're going to implement your prescription on the ground. Also incorporating natural stand development processes, including small scale disturbances into intermediate treatments. So what we mean by this is thinking about a fire that might burn a group of trees. We could go in and actually select a group of trees to be removed as if that fire, a fire was going to burn them. And then also allowing for appropriate recovery periods between regeneration harvests. This is simply just letting stands mature before repeating an entry and uh, doing a, a follow-up harvest. Okay, so to get to the specifics, uh, I'm going to focus this conversation on two wet mixed conifer timber sales on the Pagosa district that Headwaters uh, was pretty heavily involved in conversations about um, through a series of workshops. Um, and I believe there was a couple site visits CFRI has been a part of these dialogues as well. And so these are the Huerto and Pagosa Creek timber sales. They're wet mixed conifer forests on the Williams Divide and Black Mountain roads. Um, so Black Mountain being the, the road that folks access to summit Pagosa Peak. Um, and then, you know, one thing I'll point out is these are wet, extremely wet systems. As I mentioned in the title, uh, we jokingly call them the San Juan Rainforest. And there is a legacy of management on this landscape. Uh, particularly noticed, noticeable is um, a large Douglas fir removal legacy. So there's a lot of very large Douglas fir stumps on the landscape. And as we'll get into it, there's still some pretty large residual Douglas firs. Um, and then also there's a really strong presence of spruce budworm on this landscape. And this is in part what's sparked some interest in um, managing these geographies. And uh, I should also note that spruce bark beetle is present in Engelman spruce where present on this landscape. So these timber sales have a few key objectives um, that I'm going to summarize in a fairly simple form here. Um, one is to increase spatial heterogeneity, just get some of that complexity on the landscape. Another is to facilitate natural regeneration that has a lessened spruce budworm intensity. There's also some interest in promoting aspen sprouting in some areas. And then lastly, there's um, an objective to monitor outcomes and ensure that desired conditions are generated from actions. And that's going to be kind of the crux of what I focus on from here out is some of this monitoring. 
So Mountain Studies Institute works pretty closely with the San Juan National Forest to develop a comprehensive project scale monitoring that documents spruce budworm damage on mature and understory trees, assesses conditions and different treatment components of the project area, and understands shrub dynamics following treatment. And more specifically, I want to take these objectives and uh, give us some spatial context and then formulate some more specific questions. So again, looking at San Juan Headwaters geography, we got Pagosa Springs right down here on the San Juan River, and then up the Piedra Road, uh, and then over First Notch into, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the road that cuts over, but the, up on the, the uh, Black Mountain Road over here is the Pagosa Creek timber sale, and then just to the northwest of that uh, above Williams Reservoir on the east side of the Williams Divide is the Huerto Creek uh, timber sale. And both of these, as depicted by the vegetation type, are in these wet to aspen mixed conifer mixed forests. So the specific questions that we're really trying to answer with this monitoring are, can we refine an ecologically appropriate civil cultural system in mixed conifer? And this to me is more of a broad question that we can take a whole assortment of data points to answer, but we'll, we'll get into it when we actually look at what we do on the ground. Um, and then also, can we manage for forest products and a mix of species compositions and desired conditions using natural regeneration? So what we mean is we want to maintain that mix of species that's present or even promote it um, and still have blue spruce and ponderosa pine, Doug fir, white fir on the landscape. Last uh, are some questions about regeneration with some interest in if regeneration actually matches the conditions we expect to see, and if regeneration still occurs in various sized groups. Those groups are again, just like where we're removing uh, everything in the overstory is if a fire removed the overstory of trees. And we wanna make sure that we still have regeneration in those groups. And then we are interested in if uh, management will reduce the intensity of spruce budworm on regeneration. And then we're also interested in how these sprouting shrubs respond to some management intervention. Okay, so some closer maps of these project sites. On the left is Pagosa Creek. Um, and when I said earlier that this is a comprehensive project scale monitoring, what I mean is that we have plots across essentially the entire project area. There's a few polygons that we didn't get plots in, but we're covering most of the project area with all of the different treatment types. And you'll see lots of different colors on this. And all I wanna point out is that these different colors represent different types of treatments to help increase the variability across the landscape. And in particular, the reds are the groups where we're removing whole sections of overstory. Um, and there might be some residual overstory trees. These aren't like full on clear cuts, uh, but you know, there are some larger groups and some smaller groups. And we have plots in these different sized groups to understand some of that regeneration component. And similarly, Huerto Creek has uh, various different types of treatments as well. Um, and I'm not going to dive too much into the treatments. If we want to ask Matt, I think Matt too can give us a pretty quick overview of these treatments, but it all it's all uh, in part based on current conditions and desired civil cultural outcomes. So these are designed to create uh, that spatial heterogeneity and um, hopefully create some nice natural regeneration. So we worked pretty closely with Mary Chambers from CFRI, who spent a good amount of time with us on the San Juan um, back in the pre-COVID days to um, develop some of these monitoring protocols for these specific projects. And when we designed them, we wanted them to be adaptable to many diverse projects. And what I want to point out is this is the what we measure, not the where we measure. And uh, so huge thanks to Marin and CFRI for all the support on this. And we've gotten to go and hang out with Marin and see some of the work that she does on the front range too. So this is a, a great uh, partnership and mutualism for Headwaters and for Mountain Studies Institute. So the methods that we actually employ 
can be summed up in this diagram where we have a uh, plot center and then a 20 meter transect. And then we have a, a small one 100 acre uh, circle where we count regeneration and shrub stems. And then we have a larger 10th acre overstory plot where we uh, document overstory tree condition. And then we have three meter squared frames for looking at fuels and plant functional groups. And then along the 20 meter transect, we actually measure shrub cover and um, canopy cover for the forest. Um, but let's relate those methods to specific questions. So the first question was, can we manage for forest products in a mix of species compositions? So we used that 10th acre fixed area circle plot, counted all overstory trees and measured their diameters. And what we look at uh, or what we see and how we often summarize this data is in you know, what we call this diameter spread. So this is a, a panel for the Huerto Creek sale on the left and the Pagosa Creek sale on the right. Um, on the y-axis, we have mean tree density in trees per acre. And then on the x-axis, we have uh, two inch diameter classes starting at two inches and going all the way up to 46 inches. And then these are colored by species. So we can just start looking at Huerto and what we see is there's a whole lot of these smaller aspens and smaller white firs with um, some subalpine fir and uh, blue spruce and Engelmann spruce. And as we move up into size classes, there's fewer and fewer trees, uh, but there are some larger Douglas firs on that landscape. Similarly for Pagosa, there's uh, a ton of smaller white fir and actually a pretty good mix of white fir into some of these larger size classes, as well as a nice mix of blue spruce in some of these larger size classes and subalpine fir and Douglas fir and some larger ponderosa pines as well. And, you know, I think what's really important to point out is there's diverse tree species at each site, but they're not all in the same stands, right? So this is going to vary a lot on if you're in a stand that's more in that valley bottom versus if you're on the ridge top. All the tree mixes are there, but they're not necessarily like right next to and intermixed with one another. And then the other thing that's important to point out is uh, particularly at some of these sites at Pagosa and a little bit of into Huerto, there are some larger saw log quality sized Engelman spruces and blue spruce which is really nice to be able to have that uh, as a component that we can actually remove and still have some residual trees on the landscape um, to, to really support some of the economic viability of this project. And uh, just to reiterate, not every tree is everywhere. So some of these stands might have mostly white fir and some of them might have mostly ponderosa, but when we average it out across the entire uh, project area, this is what we end up seeing. Something that I think is really fun to look at is those diameter spreads are useful, but I, I want us to like understand how common or uncommon are these trees. Uh, and so now I have the proportion of plots with the tree found. Um, so this is a percentage, 100% would mean every single plot we found that tree and 0% would mean we never found that tree. And again, we have these different project areas. And now I just have some simpler size classes of like small trees, medium sized trees, large trees, very large trees, extra large trees, right? And uh, so what I wanna point out is that Huerto, 75% of our plots have small to medium sized white firs. So that's a really common component of this landscape. Similarly, Aspen is uh, sitting right around this like 30% range. And Douglas fir is sitting um, also near this like 30, 35% range. But then when we look at these larger trees, they're actually quite uncommon. Just a couple percent of our plots have trees of these larger size classes. So they're pretty rare on that landscape. In particular, very large Douglas firs are rare. And there's a few uh, larger ponderosa pines, but they're also rare. Similarly for Pagosa, again, we see these like medium sized white firs are our most commonly found tree species. And as we increase in size, they become less and less common, but there are more frequent occurrences of 
Douglas fir and ponderosa pine in some of those larger size classes at uh, Pagosa Creek. So this is just kind of a nice way to visualize like well, how common are these things that you're actually talking about and pointing out. I thought this was kind of a fun figure for looking at that. Okay, so exactly how intense is the spruce budworm outbreak uh, or an intensity of what's occurring on the landscape? On the y-axis here, we're looking at proportion of trees that had spruce budworm. Now we're just looking at these for the different species. Their um, common name is written out over here and the abbreviated scientific code on the x-axis. And so uh, first I want to point out subalpine fir was pretty uncommon, but all of the subalpine fir observed did have evidence of spruce budworm. Uh, a little over 80% of white fir at Huerto Creek and just about 75% of white fir at Pagosa Creek and similarly close to 80% of the um, blue spruce at Pagosa Creek had evidence of spruce budworm and uh, a pretty decent portion of even some of our Douglas firs. So spruce budworm is uh, very present in this geography and is found on uh, many of the mature trees in these landscapes. But of course, aspen and ponderosa pine are actually resistant. They don't receive attack by spruce budworm. So it's nice to see this in the data. And so one thing about managing for a nice mix of species is just by promoting more aspen and ponderosa pine on this landscape, we can reduce the intensity of the spruce budworm attack. And so some quick implications from the overstory is I think we have a nice diverse species, species mix and the ability to remove some saw log quality timber uh, leaves a residual mix of species, um, thus allowing us to really enhance some of those biological processes and utilize some of those small scan uh, processes to mimic natural successional trajectories. And it'll be really fun, you know, right now, I, I don't know if I explicitly said it, this is only pre-treatment data. These projects will be implemented hopefully soon. Matt will give us an update on that after this talk. Um, and then the other big implication that I just said but want to reiterate is retaining some of these residual species, residual species that are resistant to spruce budworm can reduce its intensity on overstory trees. Okay, so then there are three questions about regeneration. Can we create a mix of desired conditions using natural regeneration? Does forest regeneration match the conditions we expect to see? Um, and will it still occur in these various sized group selections? And does management reduce the intensity of spruce budworm on regeneration? So these methods, we utilize this 100 acre fixed radius plot and we counted all stems of regenerating trees. So here's um, Emily and Landon looking for some regeneration and perhaps being a little miffed by the overall lack of regeneration in this photo. Uh, one way that I think is useful to display this, and I apologize, I shouldn't have done this as a stacked um, bar graph because it misleads us a little bit on the number of plots we completed, but the story is still the same. Um, and so uh, again, these are colored by species, but now on the y-axis, we're looking at the number of plots rather than the proportion of plots that uh, something occurred in. And on the x-axis, we're looking at the number of seedlings or saplings. In other words, if we look at zero, we found zero seedlings or saplings, a whole lot of our plots had zero seedlings or saplings. And as we move up the scale, there's some uh, Engelman spruce and some blue spruce and some aspen and white fir seedlings that we've documented on that landscape. Uh, quite a few plots had one or few seedlings. Uh, and then as we move up into the hundreds of seedlings or saplings. There are quite a few plots, but not many plots where we see hundreds of aspen stems. But what's important about this is most plots had zero to few individuals of regenerating trees. And um, we can also look at the proportion of trees that had spruce budworm on them in the, in the seedling sapling category. And it, fortunately, we actually don't see those upwards of 75 to 100 percent numbers. But again, our uh, blue spruce, white fir, and Douglas fir 
all starting to find some sign of spruce budworm on these regenerating trees. And going back to this idea that many plots had zero regenerating trees, including some of these aspen stems, you know, I think I, I definitely know from both plot notes that my field crews recorded and from spending time out at these sites that this just does not actually represent the landscape at all. 100 acre plots are probably actually too small to capture some of these patterns on these landscapes. And this could be a fine scale spatial pattern thing. It could be um, the way our random plots are generating um, where they are and thus our circle or small circle just isn't capturing things. But there are um, many cases where our surveyors would be doing their circle plot and it would end and there'd be numerous regenerating trees just outside of where we were actually surveying for trees. So I think this is more of a, a fallacy in the method that we decided to use. And what's important about this method is that, you know, uh, Marin helped us with these protocols and she was doing work on the Uncompahgre Plateau where this method was working great. They were capturing a pretty representative idea of what tree regeneration was. And I've used this method in Northern Arizona where the methodology is ideal. You have a blanket of seedlings and a small circle is a great way to count and estimate the number of seedlings you have. But it doesn't seem to be capturing what's actually occurring in these systems here in the San Juans. So something that I might suggest is that we work on modifying and improving how we document regeneration in these systems. Quite a few studies, including a good friend of mine, Kyle Rodman and, and Carlson, have used belt transects uh, to capture a larger area and get a better picture of variability of regeneration in the landscape. So considering a larger fixed area plot like a belt transect or even a larger circle plot might be a better way for us to understand some of these regeneration dynamics. Okay, so then lastly, we, we have this question about how management influences sprouting shrubs. And I think there's an important follow-up question. What are some of the implications of shrub responses on natural regeneration? And to do this, we use that same 100 acre circle that we counted conifer regeneration in or tree regeneration in, and we counted every single stem of shrub, um, with the exception of snowberry, because it's way too much to count all those stems. Um, and then we did a 25 meter transect to quantify shrub cover. Okay, so we can ask then how dense are shrubs? And now we're just looking at shrub stems per acre and again, colored by um, species. So we have a Rocky Mountain maple, service berry, choke cherry, and gamble oak. And in Huerto Creek in particular, we see extremely high stem density of service berry and even a couple hundred stems per acre of gamble oak. Um, the Gamble Oak numbers are pretty similar to Julie Korb's pre-treatment data from Middle Mountain, just for perspective. And our service berry stem numbers are, are quite high uh, relative to other studies I've seen, but I don't know that I've seen that many studies from wet mixed conifer forests like these. Um, and then Pagosa Creek actually has way fewer shrub uh, stems per acre. And, who knows why this could be a question of soils or overstory stand conditions, but it's interesting to note that the shrub density of Pagosa Creek is way lower. Uh, I, I'm blown away by the forb diversity. The wildflowers at Pagosa Creek are absolutely stunning. To, to be able to walk around there during blooming season it is absolutely incredible, uh, but it doesn't have a lot of these sprouting shrubs. So kind of a curious difference between these two project areas. Okay, so uh, one species, snowberry, that I mentioned, we didn't count stems of because they have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little stems, so it would take forever. But you know, I think it's important to not just think about the density of those stems, but the amount of area that they actually cover within that landscape on that 25 meter plot. And so again, colored by species, we see a whole, whole extra list of species, including some of our gooseberries and woods rose, um, Choke cherry, Rocky Mountain, uh, that's Rocky Mountain juniper, I should say common juniper. Um, so that's a typo on my end. Um, but snowberry at 
Muerto Creek was nearly 25% of the area cover or almost 50% of total shrub cover. So I think this is an interesting thing to note. We didn't count that particular shrub stem density, but it is quite abundant on that landscape. But then service berry, if you remember, had really high stem densities and corresponds to actually a really small sliver of um, foliar cover on that landscape. So high stem density doesn't always eat uh, cover, but instead Rocky Mountain maple has another uh, shrub or maybe more like tree with pretty uh, strong cover on that landscape. And then again, just to reiterate, we saw quite a bit less cover at Pagosa Creek and this common juniper, not Rocky Mountain juniper, uh, was one of the more common shrubs in that geography, which again, we didn't um, document its density. So, you know, an important question with this is we have nearly 50% shrub cover at Muerto Creek. Is there potential for these shrubs to outcompete conifer regeneration? Um, and then I just want to reiterate that a lot of stems per acre of service berry doesn't necessarily yield high cover of that plant. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, you know, I think for shrubs, we really need to start diving more into these questions and do further analysis on the relationship between canopy cover and shrub cover and regeneration density. But right now, if you recall, there were mostly zeros in that regeneration data set. So using a zero inflated regeneration data set, these analyses aren't going to tell us a whole lot. So maybe doing a better regeneration survey and capturing some of these other components of the landscape like canopy cover might be a useful next step to help us understand the shrub conifer relationship and dynamic on this landscape. Okay. We also collected some data, um, as mentioned in that initial method slide, on understory plant functional groups, field loads, and canopy cover. I am choosing not to present these uh, data because I've already presented a lot of data, and these are a little less relevant to some of these specific monitoring questions that we wanted to pull to the surface in this monitoring effort. Of course, we're still interested in field loads. That has implications for fire though it doesn't reflect one of our clear, clearly defined questions. So I'm going to pass on sharing these data for right now, and perhaps these will be more fun to look at post-treatment. To give a last implication synopsis, uh, I think the big outstanding uh, storyline from this is that the presence of saw log grade lumber from valuable species have important economic value and removing some of those saw log grade trees while retaining other large trees and less common features can help create a nice mix of species diversity on this landscape and uh, really help promote some of those biological legacies and processes that is grounded in ecological forestry. Uh, we see a lot of spruce budworm on this landscape and there's also a lot of spatial variation in I didn't really show the variability about the mean, but the spruce budworm is uh, pretty variable depending on this mix of species. So, right, like less, where you have more ponderosa, you see less spruce budworm. Um, and then at least how we counted regeneration, we saw fairly limited conifer regen pre-treatment. And then next steps, uh, you know, I think once we get in and implement and go out for post treatment monitoring, we'll have a lot more depth to really think about and understand how are conditions changing in these project areas following management. Um, and maybe as some of those results arrive, we'll start to formulate some more specific questions of interest. I think something that's important to point out is monitoring could always reveal something that we should have looked for and didn't for whatever reason. So using these data and, and conversations like what we're having today for the science forum to always adapt what we're doing, not just in terms of management, but in terms of what we're monitoring and what questions we're asking. Okay, so management and monitoring and pairing these two things together, um, you know, I think the idea that um, management and monitoring that informs learning and adapting new ideas and strategies is always going to be the best types of monitoring on the landscape. Monitoring for the sake of monitoring doesn't get us very far, but monitoring to help us learn and adapt is 
ultimately where we want to strive to be. And as an example, I think our regeneration surveys and just paying attention and having uh, good training to our field crews so they're taking good notes and recognizing that our survey methods didn't really capture what's actually happening on the ground. It's like an adaptive monitoring strategy, right? We're, we're looking at that and looking at our data and saying, wait a second, this just doesn't quite make sense. I think we need to start trying something different in this, this geography. And I think this is a really great example of monitoring that's informing learning and adaptation. And the other thing, you know, Matt, Matt kind of pushed me to make sure this message got across and I was contemplating how to make sure this message got across. And I, I think I was just gonna, gonna explicitly say it because you know, these areas were outlined by the Headwaters Group um, 10 years ago as a management priority to, to really think about and understand the, the wet mix kind of for forests. And there's a really strong interest from this stakeholder group to incorporate ecology into active management. And given these ecologies are a little different than ponderosa pine and drier forest types, it's not really traditional restoration. And I think, you know, Matt and I both have been talking a lot about ecological forestry. And I just think it's really cool to bring this principle that is a pretty common language in the Northeast and in the Northwest, but less common here in the Southwest and start thinking about how do we apply this to our landscape? And, you know, I think the Headwaters Group is critical to really working together to improve management over time. And other examples that I'm not going to share data on, uh, but we have great partnerships with Mike Battaglia and Linda Nagel on the Adaptive Subculture for Climate Change Study. We have great partnerships with Julie Korb on the, the Middle Mountain Study, and we're learning a lot of new ideas that are certainly shifting how we think about the science of these forests and also shifting how we think we want to manage these forests. So I think I just want to point out that Headwaters is and will continue to be a leader in the dialogue of mixed conifer management. So I guess, Pat, Pat you're, all of you can take a moment to pat yourselves on the back and really ponder that this is a true statement for now and I think well into the future. And, you know, I think this science form is really bringing us together to go through a specific example and then really start thinking about formulating specific questions. So I want to just start with sharing a couple of my questions. Like, I'm really fascinated by the factors that are influencing the cover of different shrub species across the landscape. And I think we're starting to build some data sets where we can do an observational analysis of data and then maybe start thinking about how do we work with our civil culturalists to make an experimental approach of can we can we find that ideal like group size of trees to limit shrub cover and promote regeneration? Can we actually like come up with ways to use civil culture to get desired conditions in the shrub component and maintain and promote these species for wildlife use and do it in a way that also facilitates some of our other desired conditions? Um, and then I'm also really interested in this question that lots of researchers are asking these days about what are the strongest predictors for conifer regeneration in these forests? Is it soil moisture? Is it the amount of snow that accumulated? Is there a, a change in soil moisture from doing canopy removal that has compounding in, uh, effects on tree regeneration potential? These are the types of questions that I think are cutting the edge and really interesting in my brain. But, you know, I think that we're going to spend the next hour or so, or a little less than an hour, really thinking about your values and concerns on the landscape. And I think it's important to just point out that questions reflect values and potential concerns. And so, you know, I think we're working together, together to protect diverse values as a stakeholder group. And I think our exercise that we're going to do after Matt gives us a little tour is identifying what value we, we have for these landscapes, what potential risks or concerns we have in regard to these values, and then think about how to ask specific questions that are measurable to better understand these values and risks. So I'm excited to, to work with you all and see what all you all have in your, in your mind about this. And with that, um, happy to take questions and comments or defer to, to Dana if we need to just punt to Matt because I talked for way too long and you're all tired of hearing me blabble on and on. But thanks a bunch for the opportunity to share some of the pre-treatment data from 
uh, Pagosa and Martell Creek. Great, thanks, Mike. I think um, it's okay that you talked for a while. The content was awesome. Um, and we can tell that you're excited uh, to share the data and the information and it's valuable to us. So um, I think in the interest of time, if it's okay with everyone, I'm gonna pivot to Matt Tootin and then we'll do like a quick little section of questions right after Matt talks. And then we're gonna um, move into breakout groups. So I guess if you are not comfortable with that, um, put that in the chat or raise your hand, like if you've got a burning question right now for, for Mike. Um, but otherwise, I think I'm gonna pivot over to Matt Tootin. Um, and Matt needs to be able to share his screen. So let me make that happen. Okay, Matt, you should be good to go. Um, everybody, uh, this is Matt Tootin, if you don't know him, he's the silviculturist here on the San Juan. And, um, He's going to give us a little tour focusing on Pagosa and Huerto Creek that Mike just talked about. All right, hi, everybody. Uh, there we go. I'm good. Well, so yeah, like, like Dana just said, I'm Matt Tootin. I think most of you guys know me. Um, I'm the forester silviculturist here on the Pagosa district. And I'm gonna kind of make this quick because I feel like we should get to questions and talk a little bit about some of what Mike just, just or presented. But real quick, I'll just show you where these places are relative to, to Pagosa Springs. Um, this is Highway 84, 160 um, intersection. And we'll just jump to Pagosa Creek. So this is the, the first contract. We contracted this uh, three years ago. And so this is actually at the far end of Plum Ta Road, um, right before it uh, ties into McManus Road. Um, this sale or this contract and the Huerto contract were awarded to a contractor out of Salida. Uh, this is CRS um, Incorporated. And this is Sean Cheeseman, um, a logger he said out of Salida, who's historically worked really closely with Montrose Forest Products, so the, the mill in Montrose, Colorado. And when we put this out for bid, um, we got Sean Cheeseman to bid on it, and he's essentially a new operator with a, a lot of capacity to do forestry work um, on this landscape. Never really has worked here before. Um, so he's going to start work in this Pagosa Creek landscape in the spring, um, possibly towards early summer, depending on what conditions we have on the ground. Um, he's fairly productive, and I think he'll be completing this within a year or two. So we're likely to see a lot of work on this contract uh, in the summer of this year into the fall. And then moving over here, this is the Huerto contract. Same contractor. John Cheeseman, CRS Incorporated. Um, this is the area that's just west of Williams Reservoir, um, right at that sort of junction between um, Williams Road and the Piedra Road. Um, this will likely be where this contractor moves right after Pagosa Creek um, into early next year and the following year. Um, so yeah, I suppose one other thing that I'll mention is that Forrest was very successful this year in getting a uh, great American Outdoors Act funding. And so we're gonna be putting around $3 million of gravel on Piedra Road, which is gonna support some of this effort, removal of logs, um, and it's gonna improve the condition of that road, something that we've needed for a while. Um, and I think, think some of this work was helpful in making us competitive for that money. Um, but with that, let's just jump to questions. And um, yeah, I can answer any other questions folks might have on this stuff. All right, thanks. Great, um, do folks have questions for Matt regarding the implementation uh, this summer at Pagosa and Huerto Creek or for Mike about the wealth of information that he provided? Um, I'm seeing in the chat, um, what are the CCF removals for each sale, Matt? 
Um, yeah, so so Pagosa Creek, and I haven't looked at these numbers for a little while. Pagosa Creek's around 4,000 CCF overall. Um, and Huerto, I think, was around 12,000, um, which is essentially the same volume per acre as um, Pagosa Creek, but Huerto is about three times as big. So um, that's why there's a lot more volume coming off there. Great. Um, Jimbo, I see your hand up, and then I have another question in the chat that I'll read after you. Um, yeah, I get a couple questions here, but Matt, can you give us a little snapshot of the prescription? So, I mean, the background for this for me is that we have this very diverse forest. We got a lot of budworm in there. Um, the region, I mean, is lame. I mean, we're also I'm noting that what um, Mike said about it seems to be all just beyond a circle. However, I mean, my roaming around um, the Pagosa district this summer, just I was alarmed at, like I am kind of across the forest at, at a lack of regen in a lot of, a lot of places. So can you just tell us like, you know, what the, what the strategy is here? I mean, like if you're into, let's say either of those areas, Puerto or, or Pagosa Creek, and you're looking what's out there, um, you know, what's what's the plan, right? Like, I know you're not gonna go for the, the biggest trees, um, and but are you going for trees that have been hit by budworm already? Um, and in what species? I don't, I don't kind of catch what the prescription is. So if you could kind of lay that out with us, I think that'd be, Maybe helpful. So, you know, sort of like what is the response? I mean, Mike's laid out what the issues are. And so, how are we going about this ecological forestry to mimic nature? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, let, let's just focus in on Pagosa Creek because I think it might just be a little bit easier to explain. But I think that the same concepts are applicable to, to Huerto that are taking place on Pagosa Creek, just the uh, the arrangement's a little bit different and the mix is a little bit different. So in the, the mixed conifer forest, we we have aspen mixed in almost everywhere. Um, there are some areas that are less, respond less intensively to harvest um, of aspen and conifer. So I mean, generally what happens when we remove conifer, we, we get sprouting of aspen. And that's what's going to happen after a fire. Um, that's essentially why we have big patches of aspen on our landscape. Most of it established after a fire. Um, so that's a big component of this. The other thing is that we, we haven't had fire in these stands for the last century or more. Um, and so we've, we've had an ingrowth of species that would be thinned by fire. Um, at longer time frames, and in these stands, that's most of your conifers, um, but less Douglas fir and ponderosa pine because those species have adaptations to fire. And so, while a fire might move through and burn up most of the conifer, the stuff that might survive is that the Douglas fir and the ponderosa pine where they're present. Um, and then after that fire, you'd see a lot of aspen sprouting. And so, in these areas sort of a common thing that we're seeing is that there's a lot of white fur, Mike pointed that out, of different sizes. We have a lot of aspen. There's a lot of aspen that's declining, so it's towards that upper end of its age range and it's starting to fall down. Um, and it's just natural secession, essentially, in this stand in the absence of fire. And so our prescription really is to mimic what a mixed severity fire might do in this landscape. And so what that's gonna be is patches of very open condition where we um, promote aspen. And this is over about a quarter of the area. And within those areas, it's gonna be very open, but with retention of some of the large Douglas fir or pine where they're present, not a whole lot of pine in this landscape, but there is quite a bit of Douglas fir. Um, and any Douglas fir, because that, that's the species that was harvested in the past, 
And we definitely want to increase its representation because a lot of it was removed in the 1960s. So in those openings, we're going to see removal um, of a, a lot of tree cover, with just a little bit of residual forest and promotion of aspen. So get, try to get aspen sprouting in. Elsewhere, we're trying to maintain forest canopy cover, and we're really looking at trees that are at the edge of their lifespan, starting to decline. And across the areas between these openings, we're really looking at just harvesting some white, white fir, removing some of the declining white fir, some of the larger diameter white fir. Um, not much else other than some, some trees that might be really heavily loaded with mistletoe or are just declining, are gonna fall down. Um, and that's essentially the approach that we're using in Huerto, groups over about a quarter of the area, mimicking sort of that higher severity patches of a mixed severity fire, and then just removing some white fur in the inner spaces between the groups. Does that kind yeah, of clarify? Yeah, that's really helpful. Just a quick follow up on that. Do you have the resources for marking or not? Yeah, so we, we do. Um, in, in all cases, we, we haven't used marking, right? So um, our groups that we put in, we have to really identify those or it's just going to be really hard for someone to, to manage a contract where we're just putting a quarter of the area in groups, right? So we, we pre-identified groups with the marking crew. Um, and then throughout the areas between the patches, we, we did that removal by prescription and that's focused on the species white fir and then also includes any trees that we marked for removal and so the only thing we're doing by prescription is removing white fir everything else is done with marking paint okay great thanks matt that's so super helpful kind of combo, um, but i think it works yeah. good here thanks um Thanks, Jimbo. Uh, we've got time, I think, to address a couple more questions. Uh, Mike has asked a question in the chat um, of the other Mike. Um, so you mentioned, Mike Remke, that the projects will have different size groups in the group selection. Um, what size are the groups? Yeah, si size of the groups. Um, some of this was outlined in the planning documents. So we, we can kind of ask um, Steve Ark is in what his rationale was. <laughs> um, Ooh, and how did you decide where to put the groups? Is that also a Steve Harvison question? No, no. So, I mean, what I liked about what Steve did in the planning was that he, he proposed something that makes more sense based on the ecology of this forest than it would to foresters elsewhere, which makes it hard to discuss this with other foresters, but it makes it really relevant here. And so he, he promoted a range of group sizes from less than an, an acre, around a half acre in size, all the way up to around, I think, 15 to 17 acres as the maximum size. And I think the average was like two, two acres in size. Um, we, we definitely put the groups in places where we had mature declining aspen or declining conifer or a combination of the two. Um, there, there's patches out there where we have younger, smaller diameter aspen. We have a lot of variation in this landscape. And so we, we definitely focus the patches on areas of things that were declining as opposed to things that were, were sort of taking off. Um, and there's some variation within the, those themes I just mentioned about where we put these, but those were the, the general approaches that we used. Um, another question in the chat, is there a Douglas fir beetle present in these areas? There definitely is. Um, Douglas fir beetle is a different type of beetle than, and it, it works, it sort of works its way through the forest differently than other beetles, almost like very differently. And so it doesn't tend to impact broad stands in, in one big kind of event like you see up at Wolf Creek Pass. It just kind of works its way through, kind of peaks some years and goes away. Um, part of 
this forest actually had some pretty severe Douglas fir bark beetle outbreak since the time of the planning document, which was about 10 years ago. And to the point where whole areas have died and just fallen down. And so we've seen some of that. We didn't see a whole lot of it um, currently infesting any of the Douglas fir, but it's, it's always possible. Um, we know that a lot of repeated spruce budworm activity on the crowns of those trees can make them more susceptible to budworm. So I think we're going to see some benefits for, for reducing the hazard of spruce budworm in this these areas by reducing um, the impact of spruce budworm. Sorry, I don't know if that made sense. We'll, we'll see reductions in spruce or Douglas fir beetle because of reductions in spruce budworm. If that makes sense. Um, great. And then I've got another two part question. So in the objectives, um, there is no specific mention of reducing the risk of severe wildfire. Is that a goal for these projects? Um, I'll stop there and let you answer that part first. Yeah, <laughs> this is a good question. And this kind of gets at how this is really different from other projects. I mean, you'll notice that here's, I guess you're not really seeing my screen anymore, but, um, Pagosa Creek is a long way from town. Like this is definitely not um, the wildland urban interface. You know, there's some private land nearby, but it's essentially broad undeveloped acres. Um, and it's on the edge of Pagosa Peak, right? So this is in the middle of nowhere. Um, the, the same is kind of true for Huerta. It's a little bit closer to some, some recreation infrastructure, but we don't have values that we're protecting. We, we also are in a mixed severity fire regime, right? So Mike kind of mentioned this, is that we're not looking at surface fires historically in these forests every two to 12 years. We're looking at fires that may have burned at longer periods with a higher proportion of higher severity outcomes. So like blowouts from fires versus fires creeping through these stands. And so, uh, the longer end of that interval between fires could be, you know, 80 years, plus or minus, right? And in 80 years, you can have conditions that really lend themselves to a really intense fire in, the, in these forests. And so, to some degree, severe fires are okay, um, given historic reference conditions. But I think the, the difference here is that we're kind of going all in across a, the whole landscape in these types of forests because we haven't had much fire. And so we're trying to really do something that's compatible with the historic fire regimes, but isn't necessarily trying to um, restore low severity fire regime conditions. So reducing hazard is an outcome, but it's not necessarily the goal, if that makes sense. This is a little different. Sorry, was somebody about to say something? And oh, I just said thanks for that explanation. Yeah, and then the, the second part of Caleb's question was, uh, Mike, in your data, there's a lot of white fur. Uh, what are the desired conditions for white fur composition in these stands? That's great. <laughs> so what's great about white fur is that we actually do have a market for it. White fir is also a relatively short-lived tree relative to ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. Those trees tend to be our very oldest trees. They can be hundreds of years old. White fir tends to decline around 180 years old. It's really starting to be essentially a hollow tree at that point and starts to pile up on the ground um, after it dies. And so what we're really doing is we're removing the larger white fir, the stuff that's near the end of its life and we're retaining almost all of the smaller diameter stuff that's less than about 10 inches. And so we're gonna have small white fur in these stands. We wanna have white fur as a component of these stands, but we don't want a continuous cover of white fur between all the other tree species. And we don't want a continuous um, vertical um, sort of uh, layer of white fur from the understory to the overstory of different sizes 
because that kind of exacerbates that spruce budworm issue. So we're basically moving towards younger white fir that are going to grow into older trees over the next 30 to 40 years and taking those trees out that would die over the next 30 to 40 years and become um, wood on the ground. Great. Um, so Danny uh, of Dwarf over on the other side of the forest has a great question and I think it's going to lead us nicely into our breakout groups in maybe two or three minutes. So um, it's a it's a one two punch just like Caleb's. So um, the left hook is how were the specific monitoring questions developed and then the right hook is uh, how could an experimental approach like this be scaled up to more acres? And when would we feel comfortable to do work on a larger scale based on our monitoring results? So um, let's do this question. And then uh, I think we're going to transition into our breakout groups. And I'll give a little more instruction before then. Yeah. Um, I think just real quick, I mean, and there were a lot of conversations on this. I think starting almost 10 years ago when, when the planning was done for this project. So I, I think some of the questions were tied to that planning effort. Um, some of those were refined a couple of years ago. I think some folks were involved in these conversations. We, we had some folks from the, the Forest Restoration Institute in Arizona up here. We had some folks from Fort Collins down um, to, to talk about some of our mixed conifer questions. And I think a lot of this focused in on what are the types of disturbances we'd be trying to emulate and what are the types of responses that we'd want to try to get um, after we try to emulate these types of disturbances through a harvest and so that's where a lot of those questions came from um, kind of over a long period of time and then got a bit refined especially when mike got involved and started working on the methods um, i i think to some degree we're, we're we're doing some of the scaling up right now. And I think paying attention to this um, regeneration response question is something that we're going to do everywhere because it's important. But I think we definitely want some more input about what are some of the other things we need to be paying attention to, particularly when you see more of this work in a lot of different places. Because I think you get some, some different questions when you see work in a lot of places versus just one spot. And so I, I think um that the, the level of comfort is going to depend on a lot of input from folks um seeing this work get done on these projects at least that's my perspective on it great thanks for the question danny um, so I think we're going to go ahead and transition so that we can have a little bit of small group discussion. So just so folks know, I've got um, I've got four people that are going to help lead the breakout groups and I'll be able to kind of pop in between them. So um, your four breakout group leaders are Matt Tooten and Mike Remke, who you already have gotten acquainted with. And then um, Aaron Kimpel, who is the Forest Programs Director at Mountain Studies. And then also Mike Battaglia with the Rocky Mountain Research Station is going to be helping lead uh, your discussion group, depending on which one you are in. So um, just a quick kind of overview of what the goals are is, you know, you've heard from uh, Matt and Mike, and now we want to hear from you. So the goal is that we want you to think about what are your values as they relate to our landscape? What are some potential concerns that you have? And um, what questions come up for you that you're interested in the group working to investigate? And to keep in mind that we're looking at this through the lens of forest, forest management and monitoring. So um, there are all sorts of interests that can be wrapped up into that, right? Wildlife interests, recreation interests, ecological, forest um, health interests. So based on your agency and your position, you know, you may articulate different goals, values, and questions. Uh, those breakout group folks are going to record the information. I'm going to take it and that's going to help inform part two of our science forum in April. So um, excuse the maybe moment of awkwardness while I make sure I get you all in the right groups with the facilitators all 
not in a group together. And um, I will see you back here. And um, probably it looks like in about 20, 25 minutes, and I'll be kind of popping back and forth. Um, great. Aaron, did you have something to say? I couldn't tell. You're leaning forward like you might. <laughs> No, I think this is great. I think this will also help inform, you know, some information that we can bring forward to the group in the future, you know, as we call out some of these and where we might have, um, be able to identify research and um, further presentations throughout the year. Okay, great. Um, twiddle your thumbs for a moment while I uh, distribute you all into breakout groups. Okay, we're just going to give folks a, a minute to get back in. It's always so abrupt when those breakout rooms end. It's like, I know there's the countdown, but it's like, could you imagine being in a meeting and then all of a sudden you just teleport to a different room? Like, I know. <laughs> I, tried to give you, I tried to give you lots of warning, <laughs> but because it is always a little bit uncomfortable. But um well, thank you everybody. I I was um I was teleporting myself to all four of your different rooms and um, I have a smile on my face because there is a great diversity of conversation happening and um great information coming forward. So I appreciate all of your time today. Um, Aaron was asking me about the report out scenario. And um, so this, this science forum is scheduled for two hours and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and my original plan was, so um, your, your all-star facilitators are gonna have the notes of your conversation. They're gonna send them to me. I'm gonna um, compile the information and all of you will get um, a nice kind of tidy copy of that. And then I'm also gonna use that to help inform and drive our conversation on April 14th for the first hour in which we're gonna look at the questions and concerns that are coming forward from you all as stakeholders. And then think about different locations physically on our landscape where we can investigate and or address those concerns. So. Um, you didn't just have a conversation for not. Um, I just want to make sure that we respect everyone's time and that um, you will get the information so that you'll know what was talked about in the other groups. And then it's going to be the foundation of our conversation in April also. So um, with that, part two of our science forum is going to be held Wednesday, April 14th from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, I did send out a calendar invite, but um, if you need the information again or you have questions about it, please feel free to contact me. Um, that's going to focus on opportunities to explore our questions and values on the landscape, as well as have a, a section about regional applications of the work that we do and the questions that we investigate as a place based collaborative. So we're going to have um, it'll be, you know, what are our broad broader regional applications and um, this also is great because it's going to help inform opportunities to engage specialists and um, and experts from across our region into the future. So this isn't our only chance at having a science conversation as a as a stakeholder group this year. So um, with that, we've got about a minute left. Does anybody have any closing thoughts, ideas? And then I'll be again sending out that information once it's compiled. And if my um, facilitators could stay on the phone just for one minute, that would be wonderful. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I'm getting lots of chat conversation, but um, everyone's silent. <laughs> So um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Thursday and look for some follow-up information and um, please uh, mark your calendar for the 14th. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks.